The problem is that the Taliban ruled, but they did not govern. We don't have a Taliban policy as to what they want to do regarding um, humanitarian relief. Hello and welcome to the G Zero World Podcast. This is where you'll find extended versions of my interviews on public television. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today it's been three months since the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. The Taliban remains firmly in control. And as the country faces a bitter winter, the United Nations says that nearly 23 million people in Afghanistan will experience food insecurity by March. Can the Taliban stave off starvation for the people it now claims to govern? And is there anything the international community can do to prevent this countdown to catastrophe without emboldening a militant group known for its human rights abuses? I speak to renowned journalist and author Ahmed Rashid. He wrote the critically acclaimed book, Taliban, Militant Islam, Oil and Fundamentalism in Central Asia, way back in the year 2000. And he says not a lot has changed with the group since. I also welcome back to the show Pashtana Durrani, and she was hiding in Afghanistan the last time we spoke, no longer. In October, she fled Kabul and is now, thankfully, in the United States. Let's get to it. The G Zero World podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, understands the value of service, safety, and stability in today's uncertain world. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. This podcast is also brought to you by Walmart. At Walmart, we are committed to creating opportunities for veterans. That's why we've hired more than 250,000 since 2013 and more than 27,000 military spouses in 2020 alone. Now we're launching a program to help veterans and military spouses find employment, gain an education, and grow veteran businesses. Learn more at walmartfindafuture.com. Ahmed Rashid, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, Of course, uh, the headlines have moved far away from Afghanistan, and that's not to the advantage uh, of the people living there. Um, Tell tell me so far, to the extent that we can make any judgment, how you think the political situation on the ground in Afghanistan is playing out now that the Americans are well gone. Well, I think there there are enormous issues. Um, uh, The the drought, uh, the COVID, the virus, the possible starvation, which the World Food Program is um, uh, alerting people already that people could be starving in a matter of days or weeks. Um, And the the, the enormous reluctance of the Taliban to take on board uh, what Western governments and the UN and other NGOs are suggesting. Um, that they ease up on, uh, uh, on, on women, on education, um, and uh, they show some uh, compatibility with, uh, with Western demands. The problem is that the Taliban ruled, but they did not govern. By the time the Americans went to war with uh, the Taliban and Osama, and Osama bin Laden, the Taliban were already hugely discredited and, and generally rendered hopeless by the Afghan population. Who had fled, and we seem to be repeating that whole scenario once again. And I think it's incredibly important now that um, the West should differentiate between recognition, which should not be on the cards for the time being, um, and actually supporting uh, the food crisis and preventing uh, millions of Afghans from starving to death. Now, is there a mechanism? I mean, we know that the Americans have frozen billions of dollars of Taliban assets. Is there a mechanism that is credible that would allow for humanitarian aid at the scale that we're talking about is necessary that would not go through the Taliban government, that would not be siphoned away or stolen uh, by officials that we can't trust? We've had very few visits from American officials um, in in Kabul, uh, and there seems to be the strongest American demand is for uh, the Taliban to run down t- terrorist groups such as Al Qaeda 
and um, uh, Islamic State, which are still active in Afghanistan. Um, and I don't think the U.S. has held these kinds of nitty gritty talks about how uh, to get fresh money. I don't see that that nine billion dollars that is lying in U.S. accounts is unlikely to be freed. And I'm sure they're, they're very complicated um, uh, uh, methodology which will be needed to free it. Instead, what you're looking at potentially is fresh money um, from uh, donors uh, who, who could pr provide it to the UN to buy food. Um, now, of course, there, there are all sorts of other things in, involved. We need, uh, me, they desperately need medical aid, uh, need, uh, um, uh, Westerners need to be able to um, come and go freely from Afghanistan who to, in order to run this aid program. Um, there's been no hint of any of this so far. It's been two and a half months now, and we don't seem to have an American strategy or a policy uh, towards how the Americans are going to react towards this uh, humanitarian crisis. You know, you wrote the book on the Taliban uh, back in 2000, uh, known worldwide. Um, if you were writing that book again today, uh, ha have they changed? Have they learned anything? Well, you know, unfortunately, again, we, we fall back on this issue of governance. We, uh, we thought uh, for a long time that the Taliban would be educating and training uh, the, their younger generation to become bureaucrats and um, uh, handlers of civil society, but we were wrong. There are a lot of cosmetic changes, such as they use iPhones, they can take pictures, which of course was, photography was banned uh, in the earlier Taliban government. We don't have a Taliban policy as to what they want to do regarding um, humanitarian relief. We don't have a Taliban policy on uh, a proper policy on education, on media, on all these very sensitive issues which people are walking around, tiptoeing around, um, and, and not wanting to face up to uh, a, a Taliban decree which will ban uh, this newspaper or that television station. The other thing, of course, is the factionalism within the Taliban. And for the time being, it seems... Uh, although it's very difficult to decipher exactly what's happening, but it certainly seems that the hardliners um, in the Taliban who don't want to make changes in their style of government or in their ideology, they're winning out at the moment. Uh, and, and leading the pack there are the Haqqanis. There are two Haqqanis in the cabinet, two more uh, uh, minor, minor officials in the cabinet, um, and they uh, are... I presume, thinking of their own future, they've got uh, a $10 million reward uh, for their capture or debt uh, from the Americans. They've got another uh, bounty from the UN. Um, the, but they are very confident because they seem to have uh, uh, wrapped any kind of voices of moderation from the Taliban on the knuckles. And they seem to be now uh, basically running the show. And uh, so it's it's very difficult for Western governments also to deal with the uh, issues of factionalism and division and who's on top now, who's not on top now. The months of negotiation in Qatar, uh, the failure to cultivate a more moderate uh, uh, Taliban. It, can we say, can we at the very least say that the Taliban for now are still in charge of the whole country, or do you start to see real chaos um, in terms of different, like in the north, for example, where it would be very hard for them to be able to impose authority, where you're starting to see just lawlessness emerge again? Well, I think, again, it all depends on whether humanitarian relief is going to uh, reach uh, the Afghan civilian population. Um, if it just reaches the elite in the cities and just reaches the Taliban military machine, and ignores the, 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 the public, uh, uh, there will be two, two results. One, there'll be a massive um, uh, walkout of the public uh, as refugees in neighboring Iran, Pakistan, even Central Asia. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and that will probably be stopped because if both Iran and Pakistan right now are, are bankrupt, basically. Uh, they, are, they have said very categorically that we cannot accept any large numbers of refugees. Um, 
And that's, you know, very much, we've seen the situation in Europe, how it's getting back to worse. Many Afghans having reached uh, Eastern Europe, uh, going through Iran and Turkey. Um, and uh, nobody's in the mood to have another influx of uh, refugees coming in from Afghanistan, uh, no matter how bad the, the pictures of suffering we see on the TV. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, that is really going to determine, um, you know, the next few months. Uh, winter is coming. It's going to be a harsh winter. People are going to be dying in this winter. There's not going to be sufficient care and um, uh, 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 warm clothing, food, etc., to 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 look after the um, uh, refugees. Remember that uh, the the refugee crisis is acute because Iran and Pakistan are still holding refugees from the Soviet period, uh, and uh, not counting those refugees who fled the first Taliban government. 20 years ago, and subsequent fighting, there's going to be a, a huge humanitarian crisis in, in the country, which the Taliban will be totally inept um, to be able to deal with. They won't know what to do. So this is a matter of the next few months. I mean, assuming that this continues to play out as it has since the withdrawal, uh, winter, we're going to see both domestic implosion um, and a very significant refugee flows out of this country. So you have a situation where uh, armed resistance on the ground has petered out for the time being. But I would say, you use the word chaos, I would say there's enormous unrest at the moment, I think, even in the cities regarding the woman. I mean, women have been coming out almost every day. Very few, not, not in their tens of thousands, but almost every day, Women are facing enormous challenges because they have to get their jobs back. And um, uh, they are the, the, the earners of uh, families in many instances. So I think we are going to see a lot of unrest and it's going to be much more easy for the opposition to organize unrest in the cities, demanding food and demanding services for the population. And, and certainly, um, the Taliban are going to use probably harsher and harsher methods to deal with that. And that, of course, will create its own snowballing crisis. On the one hand, it's these women that are in an absolutely uh, parlous state that are willing to, you know, uh, effectively throw their lives at, at, at in, in danger um, to, uh, to get their message out. And we're hearing it. But at the other hand, the Taliban government allowing it to persist, I mean, in ways that certainly wouldn't have happened uh, when you wrote your book. And I'm wondering um, why you think that is. Well, I, certainly the Taliban I, I have not uh, resumed beating women savagely in the streets the way they did uh, back in 2000 when they took Kabul. Um, and any any hint of any kind of protest would uh, lead to an always an automatic uh, harsh treatment of women and, and anyone else who was protesting. Uh, you know, that may not be happening, but what I'm trying to say is that as hunger increases, unrest increases, um, and uh, uh, more people, not just women, but men and families and come out on, onto the streets demanding wheat. Um, if you've seen some of the wheat that has come in from Iran and Pakistan being distributed, it's uh, horrific scenes of people just throwing themselves the truck, you know, trying to get a bag of wheat out. Um, and things like that are going to multiply. Um, and, you know, I, I do think it's very important that the Americans develop some kind of strategy as to how to deal with this situation. Because you're in uh, Lahore, I mean, you know, to the extent that any government, when the Taliban took over, positioned themselves as a winner, um, it was Pakistani Prime Minister Khan. Um, and it was the, hey, this is great. We're going to work with this new Taliban government. That didn't play well in the United States. Um, have they moved off of that? And I mean, I see that there are negotiations that are opening between Pakistan and the Taliban. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how you think about Pakistan's role and future. You already intimated that if there are refugees, Pakistan's going to have one of those problems and is in no position to deal with it. G give me a little bit of the Pakistan view. Well, you know, the, the, 
Pakistan, the military, the intelligence were protecting the Taliban for the last 20 years. And they were housing the leadership, their families, uh, etc., and allowing them to conduct their military operations inside Afghanistan. Now, that has led to enormous uh, um, uh, protests by, by Afghans who um, blame Pakistan for everything. They blame the Americans and they blame Pakistan for everything else. Well, what we have seen since, I, I think there have been two major shifts in policy. The first was that, the, yes, there was a lot of uh, high fives and, and back slapping and saying, well, you know, I help with the Afghans, but the Pakistanis together have defeated the Soviets, and now we've defeated the Americans, and look at this disgraceful way they pulled out, etc. Um, so, I mean, that was the initial reaction. And then uh, the, and, and that was also led to an assumption that Pakistan and its key allies, China, possibly one or two of the Arab states would quickly recognize the Taliban government. Now that has not happened. That has not happened. And that's very important because I think what, what we are seeing, especially by China and by Pakistan and by Russia, that they're backtracking a bit. They understand that if they recognize uh, the Taliban, it's going to lead to a, a major division in the international community. And then neither those who want quick recognition and those who want a delayed recognition, neither will benefit from it. So right now, I think Pakistan is, re, is reconsidering its, its motives. It's not in a, in a great hurry now. Um, and uh, I think it's trying to urge and push the Taliban uh, into complying with some of the uh, the, the, the West demands. And I think it's also making it clear to the Taliban that, look, if if you guys are met with a crisis and there's the, uh, we don't have any money, it's not like last time when the Saudis and the UAE and the Gulf states and all were fully recognized the Taliban government and backed the Taliban with money and weapons and all the rest of it. This is not the case now. Um, so... Uh, I think the uh, the mood is is perhaps more productive than it was before. Um, the fact that you do, you know, I think it's leading to a lot of concern here. There's a lot of writing about the fact that um, the Americans are not in in you know the decisions need to be made by the Americans. They have an obligation to help the Afghans uh, uh, in in terms of humanitarian relief. So all all of that is leading to an assumption by. Uh, I think many Pakistanis, and I think even decision makers in the military and intelligence, uh, that we can't just jump in and recognize the Taliban. Uh, we we have to go along with, with the, what the international community does. And but before we close, um, talk to me just a little bit about what you think ISIS and other uh, terrorist organizations' capabilities and intentions are as it stands right now in Afghanistan. There are multiple terrorist groups active in Afghanistan. And, and the truth of the matter is that they have been fighting with the Taliban against the enemies and against the Americans. Um, and these groups who in, from Central Asia, Pakistan, um, uh, 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 have been extremely active and helpful um, to the Taliban. Many of them are living along the border with Pakistan. Now, for me, the real issue is it's very easy for for the world to say, well, the, the, the Taliban have to stop all these terrorist groups. Well, the first issue is, do they want to stop these terrorist groups? Because these terrorist groups are their allies. They've been their allies in the fight uh, against the Americans. And if they suddenly tell these groups to, to stop it, go home, um, go retire, whatever, there's a big chance that these groups will turn against the Taliban, just like ISIS has turned against uh, the Taliban. So um, uh, that's the first, uh, I think, really uh, Im important issue. And secondly, what do the Taliban do with these people? Even if they would be willing to wrap them up, what do they do? Do they kill them? Do they put them in jail? Um, how, do they punish them? Uh, do they send them back to their own home countries, which of course would create, any one of these steps would create acute problems for the Taliban and acute problems for the um uh, uh, international community, because there's no sort of guideline as to, I mean, Afghanistan is basically uh, occupied by large numbers of, of terrorist groups. Well, Ahmed Rashid, we uh, we didn't resolve it, 
Uh, not that I thought we were going to, but I really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, I know that uh, you've made us all a little bit smarter on what's happening on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now to education activist Pashtana Durrani, who I caught up with a few weeks after she touched down here in the United States. We had last spoken in August amidst the chaos of U.S. withdrawal when Pashtana was in hiding from the Taliban. Since then, she's become a visiting fellow at Wellesley College and is still working desperately to ensure Afghan women and girls can continue to learn. And I welcome back to the show Pashtana Durrani. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. When I spoke to you, you were in hiding, and it was stressful as heck even to talk to you. I couldn't imagine what it would be like for you in that environment. How, how'd you get out? Um, I had people, I had friends, and I had an amazing uh, people who followed up with me, who had, like, you know, to uh, take to care of me and basically everything I owe to them. My university helped me. I had, at the same time, a friend of mine who actually works with the military. She was following up with my work and everything, and she was the one who got me out, and then she got me to Pakistan. I got my visa in Pakistan, and then I'm here as a student on a, a J1 as a researcher. So, yeah, it was pretty much legally, I went and boarded a plane for uh, Pakistan Islamabad through an NGO, and then they helped me get to Pakistan, and then through Pakistan I got to U.S. So um, you're, you've resettled now um, in my country, and I'd love to hear how it's going. It's going pretty well. I'm still working on everything that I was working when we last talked, but at the same time, I am now a visiting fellow at Wellesley. I am working, I'm researching at uh, Chi Warehouse in Wellesley, so that's uh, pretty exciting for me. I'm continuing my education. I just got to meet the president of my university, and they hosted me recently, and um, I'm glad that I get to work and I get to go to my school, so that's, that's, a good, uh, that's the highlight of my life right now. What kind of news are you getting out of the country right now? We just launched an emergency response for the children who are starving at the, like, you know, who are going through malnutrition and starvation. And most of the cases that we hear are humanitarian crisis, but also at the same time, the uh, children are the ones who are starving more, who are malnourished more. Women are the second ones who are uh, on that list. And at the same time, the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan are on verge, and the schools are still not open. Women are still barred from working. That's, that's the highlights I get from every day for, from talking to my team. Now, I mean, they're, they're claiming, of course, the Taliban government that they're going to allow women to go to school, that this is a reformed government. How much do you buy that? How much is, uh, do you see any evidence uh, that, uh, that they are, are actually trying to in any way reform? I'll believe them when they open schools for girls. I will believe them when they open uh, working spaces for girls. I'll believe them when they actually do the, uh, walk the talk instead of them like you know claiming the whatever they do for me it's more important every time they claim that that's not happening and we are reformed show me the reforms so that i can believe you i don't believe talks i believe actions now are you saying that there that no no women are attending schools in afghanistan right now so from grade one to grade six, the schools are open, but at the same time, there is a huge uh, problem of salaries that the teachers are facing right now. Uh, at the same time, uh, from class six till class 12, this, uh, uh, class seven to class 12, the uh, schools are still closed. Teachers are not teaching, girls are not attending. So that's a huge part of uh, uh, Afghanistan that's sitting at home. That's 50% of the workforce, but also at the same time, 50% of the academic force that's at home. The Americans are moving on. Um, and it's hard to keep attention to Afghanistan. What do you want the Americans to know? What would you like them to still focus on over the coming months? The only thing I'm gonna ask the Americans right now, whoever is watching this, imagine everything you have worked for, tomorrow another government comes and takes over everything that you have worked for. Your jobs, your uh, children's education, your women who are working in the workplace, that's a long-term thing. Would you be okay with it? If you're not okay with it happening to you, why are you so okay with it happening to Afghanistan? That's the first thing. And you have a very strong passport. You have a very strong government. Why don't you ask your representatives? Why don't you ask them when all that taxpayers' money went to Afghanistan, where are the results? Why are people still starving? Why are children still starving? Why are women still being punished? Why are people still being punished for just being Afghans? Now, you know, Pashtana, I mean, on the one hand, I'm really delighted to see you safe here in the United States. And on the other hand, I'm sorry 
because it wasn't your choice uh, to le leave your country. Um, it was forced upon you. Do you think that this will be a place that you can call home? I'm definitely going to uh, use this opportunity as uh, a person who would grow, who would learn more. Uh, of course, uh, embrace this place as a second home. That's like, you know, that's something uh, we as humans do. We migrate and we um, uh, get uh, like, you know, everything we could learn from the second home. But at the same time, I do hope to go back to my home and make sure whatever I have learned here and make sure that I bring the best of uh, that learning to back to Afghanistan because that, those are the people who need it the most. That's Pashana Jarani. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's it for today's edition of the G Zero World Podcast. Like what you've heard? Come check us out at gzeromedia.com and sign up for our newsletter, Signal. The G Zero World Podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, understands the value of service, safety, and stability in today's uncertain world. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. This podcast is also brought to you by Walmart. At Walmart, we are committed to creating opportunities for veterans. That's why we've hired more than 250,000 since 2013 and more than 27,000 military spouses in 2020 alone. Now we're launching a program to help veterans and military spouses find employment, gain an education, and grow veteran businesses. Learn more at walmartfindafuture.com. You're listening to the G Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.